lot of our engagements in Vector involves dealing with problems that can be best described as chronic or, or wicked or, or sticky. These are the problems where uh, people have tried their best, but they have not been able to move the needle. And it could be anywhere in, in sales or, or operations. Now, really, it's not the dearth of ideas. It's about how you do the diagnosis. The real obstacle is, is identifying the problem itself and clearly defining the problem statement. It's like winning half the battle, as they say. Now, uh, it's widely agreed that, uh, you know, when you see a problem, don't just react to it. Ask the question why. You need to find out the underlying reasons, right? And that's widely accepted. And uh, so if you take a, a problem like the sales is, let's say, stagnant, and you ask the question why, you will not get one reason. You will get, let's say, three or four reasons like uh, your, your pool is in the market is bad or your delivery is not okay, your sales productivity is the issue. So you find these three reasons. In fact, People say that don't stop there itself. You go take each one of them and drill down further. And when you do that, you'll find out that you have a what is typically known as a fishbone diagram, where a problem and then you ask the why, then further why, further why. And, and, and you get at the real issue at hand. Now, this approach, uh, which is the fishbone diagram, which is widely followed uh, in the business diagnosis, it's not adequate uh, for uh, dealing with a chronic problem. Chronic problems, uh, we need to ask the question why. But the answer that we get is usually very, very contradictory. Uh, for example, take the same question and you ask why the sales is stagnant. You ask the operations, he might point out to sales and you ask the sales, he might point out to operations. So basically, you don't know uh, which one is a fact and which is a biased opinion. Now, uh, one of the easiest way out is to say, let's look at data, because data is supposed to reveal the truth. But data at times is not available. Uh, at times, it's very sketchy. And at times, there are a lot of interfering variables inside the same data. Interestingly, um, I remember attending one of the meetings uh, of one of our clients, and people were showing stock out data. And looking at the stock out data, the uh, sales guy is saying, look at the proof. This is the proof that uh, there is a problem in operations. And the operation guy says, this is the proof that you have a huge forecasting error. So data actually does not reveal the truth as it is. Right? In fact, if you look at the society at large and, and you see uh, the belief that data is supposed to reveal the truth uh, has, has caused uh, issue in the society where people are getting more polarized about their opinion because everybody has the data to prove their point of view, right? And they say, see, my my viewpoint is true and what you're saying is fake, right? And so this, uh, this thing of demarcating what is a fact and what is an opinion is the real issue when you try to ask the question why around this chronic problem. So we need to find out uh, a better way because if you look at hard sciences, their methodological superiority is because they have been able to demarcate between a bad idea and a good idea, right? Can we borrow from them? If you look at physics and chemistry, they use experimentation to find out if something is a bad hypothesis, or something is a good hypothesis, right? So straight away, uh, you know, they can put two elements and, and say that this should create a compound. And if it does not create that compound, you throw away your hypothesis, right? Very clear uh, criteria to demarcate. But here, uh, the important point is they control for a lot of other variables, like, for example, the temperature, pressure, anything that can come in the way, uh, they control it, right? So if you take experimentation, it's a great idea to demarcate uh, between uh, good ideas and the bad ideas, between facts and opinions. But in business, we cannot do it. Take a simple example. You want to check the impact of prices on the demand of your product. Can you keep uh, the competition away from reacting to your change of prices? I don't think so. So that's the, way, that's the reason why experimentation uh, does not help. So clearly the hard sciences uh, have a lot to teach about how to demarcate uh, the good ideas from bad ideas, between facts and, you know, uh, biased opinions. But, you know, business cannot borrow from them. So where should business learn from, business management learn from? Uh, so one of the difficult uh, sciences is what we call as historical field sciences. They try to find out what happened, uh, let's say, millions of years back, right? 
and and they have puzzling questions. For example, what happened to the dinosaurs about millions of years back? Nobody has seen a dinosaur. Nobody has seen what happened to them. But the scientists have to find out what happened to them and how do they reach a conclusion that this is the reason. For example, they concluded that the reason why the dinosaurs uh, became extinct is because uh, a, a large asteroid crashed with the Earth. And how are they so sure that it is the reason and not, let's say, a pandemic or, or climate change is, is the real reason. So they follow a particular methodology of uh, diagnosis uh, which is called the hypothetical deduction method. So what they do is, since a lot of data is not available, opinions are very different from different scientists, so what they do is, they take, they see the effect that is happening out there and they say, guess the cause. And if that cause is correct, then some more other effect should also happen. Uh, for example, in this case of uh, the asteroid impact uh, hypothesis, the other effects that uh, that they found out was the traces of some elements which are only found in asteroids. They're never found in uh, the surface of the Earth. And, and let's say they found out a large uh, crater in Mexico. So all these pointed out to the direction that it's really the asteroid uh, crash theory and not really a pandemic. And in fact, in uh, criminal investigations, people do that. Who's the murderer? And there are so many suspects. So the evidence has to point towards um, uh, a particular suspect and, and it should demarcate the other suspects away. It tries to take advantage of the fact that a cause will always have multiple effects. For example, if a asteroid has really crashed on the planet Earth and, and led to extinction of dinosaurs, it should also create other effects. It should, you know, deposit a new element. So... What you try to do here is follow these three steps, right? Which takes advantage of the fact that, that the cause will have multiple effects. So what you do is you see the effect against the cause. But from that cause, try to predict what are the other effects that should exist and check for those. There should be an empirical evidence that those other predicted effects actually exist as you had thought in your mind. And that is why it is called the hypothetical deduction method. And this is the way to uh, demarcate between uh, fact and fiction, between biased opinion and, uh, and, and reality. Let me give you an example of how uh, the hypothetical deduction method is applied to demarcate between opinions and facts in a, in a business context. I give example of, uh, you know, uh, field sciences, but let me give you an example in the case of uh, business management. So um, once uh, a client called us, uh, the, the top management, the CEO called us and said that I think we have delivery issues, can you do a diagnosis? And uh, when we walked in, uh, the operations manager said, we don't have a problem. In fact, our uh, on-time performance is close to 100%. It is almost 98 point something. And uh, here is the data. Now, that was a little surprising to us. So, I'm going to describe how we applied a hypothetical deduction method to check what is happening instead of falling into the trap of let's look at your data, let's do more forensic. And invariably in such environments, you'll find out the data is not captured properly and very difficult to pin down things. So, we said, okay, if your on time is at 99 plus, it means that the plant is almost running very smooth, right? What should also happen? What should also happen is that you should hardly get any kind of a customer complaint to reschedule orders. He said, no, 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 no. I keep getting uh, customer complaints uh, and requests for rescheduling. So if this rescheduling is happening at what frequency? It's almost like every other day there is a request for rescheduling. So that should not happen and it is happening. That means you start having a doubt on what is being offered as, as the situation in that plant. The other thing that we also asked is, um, so if your on time is at 99%, uh, what is your um, dispatch, the way the dispatch is happening? Because we expect all the customers uh, required dates to be spread all across the month, right? And I said, you know what? In the last week, we do about 80% of our dispatches. Now, if your on time is at uh, high 90s and your customers' uh, due date requirements are well staggered throughout the month, you do not expect your dispatch to be so skewed. So this is the way by, by you know, asking this uh, questions of what are the predicted effects. We were able to pin down that 
there is something wrong in that data. And then we found out that the way he's calculating things is, is a problem. The way on time is being defined is, is an issue, right? So we didn't have to first look at data to establish the truth, but we established it through this hypothetical deduction method. On the face of it, the three-step process, the hypothetical deduction method looks like a, a common sense, right? Almost everybody can apply it if they know this three-step. But let me tell you that the rigor required is actually really tough. And, and to tell you the first rule that you should do is then the way you think and in the way you use language, you have to be as literal as possible. The words that you use, the definition has to be as precise as possible. Now let me give you an example here how why the precision of definitions are very, very important. So, you know, one of our clients, uh, a pharma client called us and asked us to look at the problems that they are facing in the lab. The lab, the analysts out there were making a lot of errors. And the errors were stagnant at some level. So it was a classic case of a chronic problem. They had tried their best, but the errors were at the same level. And uh, if you keep doing these errors, uh, there are regulatory authorities which can actually stop a plant from producing more or stop a new product launch. So the damages are huge. So it's not really a minor problem. It's a, it's a significant problem for a company. And one of the things that we said, okay, let's ask the question, why? Why are the analysts making errors? The first answer that came from people is, you see, our guys are not competent. Now, what does this word competency actually mean? If you ask them that what your procedures for doing this is well written, people are getting trained. So where is the problem? So on discussion, what we found out that it is actually not about the training or the written procedures. A lot of the knowledge is not written. It's, it's tacit. It's there with the experienced people. So that's the source of the errors. Yes, if that's the source of the errors, then what are the predicted effects that should happen? We should see following predicted effects. That the simple tests should have minimal errors, nearly negligible errors, because the tacit knowledge is usually required in the complex tests. We should also see that bulk of the errors are being made by uh, the freshers and the experienced guys to hardly make any errors. In fact, higher the experience, we should see less is the error. And interestingly, what we found out is that all these predicted effects did not exist, which means that the competency was not really the issue. So just to give you an example of how a well-defined word, right, and asking question to get a precision of definition helps us predict precisely what do we expect to see. If you use big words, we can't predict precisely. So that's the rule number one, that the way you use words, stop uh, using metaphors, stop using analogies, you have to be as literal as possible. So when you are doing a business diagnosis, you have to wear a hat, which is very different from day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, interaction with people. The second rule is um, we should focus on not only asking the question why, but also ask the question how. Now, these two questions should go together to understand what we call as not only the cause, but the causal mechanism. Let me give an example here, a very simple, commonsensical example. Uh, you can ask a kid, why does the sun rise from the e uh, east? They would say, because I've seen it doing every time. But that's not really the answer, because you're not offering any new information. So a better explanation uh, goes like this. Sun rises from the east because Earth's rotation in front of the sun is from west to east. So when your rotation is from the west to east in front of the sun, you get that apparent vision of as if the sun is rising from the east. Now here I have offered you the why and the how. Now because I have offered you why and the how, I now understand the entire causal mechanism. And this allows us to predict much better. For example, there are planets which move in a different way, which rotate from east to west. Now I can predict without going to that planet that the sun will rise from west because the movement is absolutely in opposite direction, right? So the sun would rise uh, from the west in those planets. So look at this. My predictability goes high, which is the requirement for hypothetical deduction method when I understand the why and also the how. So to give you an example uh, in the in the business uh, 
contexts. Let me go back to the example of the errors in the lab. What we interestingly found out that the errors are being created by the freshers, by the experienced people. Even the simple tests had errors. Even the uh, tests where all the procedures were written out, they also had errors. And people after being retrained also, uh, you know, made errors. So the problem lied somewhere else. And uh, then, you know, after uh, deep investigation, we found out the real issue is that people are overloaded with work. When I say overloaded, these are the tests where people have to remember a lot of detailed procedures and they keep it in their memory. So if you try to give them multiple work fronts, so they work from the memory and in that short term memory, they can't hold too much of information and that's the human limitation. So every time they are doing some work, they move to some other work and then when they come back, they have this misses and skips. Now that is our reasoning, our causal mechanism, everything underplays. So what do you expect to see? What is the predicted effect? The predicted effect is that wherever these instances are there, you should see a higher amount of errors. And wherever these instances are not there, you should see very less errors. And we cross-checked and we saw that yes, there are these moments where the number of work fronts that is given to a particular uh, lab analyst, it goes up. And that's where the errors are happening, the maximum number of errors. So this is the rule number two that I talked about, that you should ask the question why and also ask the question how. The third guideline uh, that one should uh, take care of is never use lack of a solution as a reasoning behind a problem. For example, if somebody has a weight issue and a chronic issue, let's say he's struggling with the weight issue for long, and you ask the question why, the answer cannot be because you do not have a treadmill at your house, that's the reason why you are having a weight issue. Now, this might sound very ridiculous, but when I come across a lot of this business analysis, it is of the same standard. I do not have something and hence I have this problem. I do not have a CRM software and hence my productivity of the sales team is um, very low. Because of this thinking of lack of something because I don't have something this way of lack of solution thinking people have invested in a lot of IT products that have never delivered the full results that was envisaged at the beginning of the assignment a lot of these uh, software products uh, have failed to deliver in many many organizations that we come across now the line of thought that you should follow is not what you don't have but what you are doing with what you already have. Life in general, if you have a problem in life, you should not say what I don't have is the real issue. The real issue is what are you doing with what you already have? If you take that line of reasoning and dive deeper, you will always see an insight to your problem. So these are the three uh, guidelines that you should use while using the, the hypothetical deduction method. What we discussed is how to apply the rigor of uh, scientific thinking as applied in field sciences or doing diagnosis of so-called wicked problems. But that's not uh, enough. In order to solve for a wicked problem, we need to also understand that in organizations, there is not one wicked problem. There are other wicked problems and they are all interlinked to each other. It's very important to understand the interlinkages of these wicked problems. If you don't understand, you solve for one and you can create a mess somewhere else. So what is also required, other than the scientific thinking, is also holistic thinking. And this together, when applied, then only we can solve for these uh, wicked problems.